Hi, Jack Ryan here uh, with the Lauren Best Practices and the Critical Tasks in Law Enforcement Operations. Uh, this is part of an ongoing series where we talk about the high risk critical tasks, a number of different areas, uh, use of force, vehicle pursuits, uh, dealing with the mentally ill, domestic violence, uh, persons of diminished capacity, and we could go on and on, care, custody, control, and restraint of prisoners. But these are, are a little bit longer than our roll call series. Um, and we hope to bring you both the law and best practice and keep you updated on what's happening uh, throughout the country uh, through this series. Thank you for joining us and, and hopefully uh, you'll find it uh, useful for you. This particular uh, section is on vehicle pursuits and I want to focus on a couple of areas. First, we're going to talk about the state of the federal law. We're going to then uh, switch over, talk about the state of the uh, tort law, which is wrongful death cases that happen in your particular states, uh, because we've got to look at what the common denominators are there as well. But before I even get the ball rolling, and, and again, I'm going to come back to this a couple of times in this um, session, is the fact that one of our biggest concerns in law enforcement is officer catastrophic injury and death. Uh, many of you know that there's been a big push uh, to get deaths below 100. I think 2015, the prelim preliminary numbers are about 124. Um, and one of the things we notice about the preliminary numbers in 2015, uh, as we move into 2016, is that car crashes seem to be up. Uh, almost 6%. Um, so that's, that's a big number uh, when we look at officer-involved deaths. One of the things to also recognize is that over the years, if we go back in the history of the Law Enforcement Memorial uh, Officers page, we see that about 3 to 1 officers get on the wall through accidents, and, and it would include car accidents, it would include officers being run over by vehicles, it would include motorcycle crashes. Obviously, the big number is the officer crashing himself. And again, those numbers run about three to one. If we look at a 10-year span, um, those numbers have changed a little bit. Um, but if we look at 2005, January, to 2014, uh, December, so about a 10-year period, we see that um, about half uh, of officer-related deaths are caused by car crashes. Now, if you add in motorcycle crashes, if you add in, uh, the, if we get a few boat crashes every year, we get several plane crashes every year. When you start to look at vehicles overall, uh, that number goes up and exceeds the number of officers who are feloniously killed. I want to focus really on the car crashes. And I think when we do that, we have to look at two distinct areas. One, is the constitutional law as it relates to crashes that happen and lawsuits um, because that's really I want to focus in on the legal. Um, certainly we're going to come back to the officer safety issue. But as we focus on the legal, we start off with what's the federal playing field look like. There's a lot of good news in the law when it comes to the federal side of the house. Um, specifically, since 1998, Back in 1998, the U.S. Supreme Court looked at a case, Sacramento versus Lewis. Some of you will probably remember this case. It's an officer who is uh, uh, sitting, talking to another officer in intersection after a call. The two officers see a motorcycle coming toward them at a high rate of speed. There's both a driver and a passenger. Turns out, the officers don't know this, but it turns out the passenger is 16-year-old Philip Lewis. And... Uh, the motorcycle does not slow down for the police cars. In fact, one of the officers does what I, I would call a really dumb maneuver. Uh, the officer actually tries to block the path of the, the motorcycle as it, as it proceeds by. Um, that doesn't work out. The motorcycle is able to make its way around the officer and take off. Now we have a high-speed chase of the motorcycle. It's the middle of the afternoon residential area. And these are the facts reported in the case that it's about a 75-second chase that travels about 1.3 miles and reaches speeds of 100 miles an hour. 
one of the things, and we see this coming up, I have an active case right now where this is an issue, uh, stopping distance. And we know, if the basic driver training tells us that it takes a certain distance at a certain speed to stop a car. Um, the officer in Sacramento versus Lewis would indicate that as he's traveling 100 miles an hour behind the motorcycle, he's 100 feet off the rear tire of the motorcycle with the front bumper of his police car. Um, that's all good until the motorcycle crashes on its own and Philip Lewis lands in the path of the police car on the street. Um, obviously, uh, the officer can't stop that police car. I think the Supreme Court says, and you accident construction guys that are listening to this will, will know this better than I will, certainly. Uh, but the Supreme Court said it would have taken over 140 feet to stop that police car at 100 miles an hour. Officer's unable to do that, and as a result, he hits Philip Lewis. Uh, Philip Lewis, according to the court, is propelled 70 feet to his death. And that's essentially the facts of Sacramento versus Lewis. One of the things to recognize in this case is this is an accident. Now, accidents under the Constitution are very different than when an officer causes harm intentionally. And when I say that, I don't mean that they intentionally wanted to hurt someone, but they did something to intentionally stop the individual's movement and the person ends up getting hurt. So we know that under the Fourth Amendment, you don't have a Fourth Amendment claim against the police officer, against the sheriff's deputy, unless the officer has seized your person. Uh, how does a seizure happen? The Supreme Court says you need two elements to come together at the same time. You need first a stopping of movement. Now clearly in this case, striking somebody with a car is a stopping of movement. There's no question about that. But in order to be a seizure under the Fourth Amendment, it also has to occur by what the court calls a means intentionally applied. So when we have an accident like this, there's no means intentionally applied, so the person does not have a Fourth Amendment claim. So as a result of that, their only other option under the Constitution is to bring what we call a substantive due process claim. Now, what does that mean? It means that I was deprived of life. I was deprived of this fundamental liberty without due process of law. Substantive due process. That's not important to you. What's important to you is this. The Supreme Court says in Sacramento versus Lewis that before a person has a substantive due process claim against the police officer, against the sheriff's deputy in this hyper-pressurized situation, the person would have to prove that the officer or deputy had an intent to cause harm, not related to the legitimate object of arrest. Almost impossible to prove, particularly when we have a case of an accident. What Sacramento versus Lewis did was it really changed the spectrum because, let's face it, if an officer accidentally crashes into anyone, plaintiff is not going to be able to prove that the officer had an intent to cause harm unrelated to a legitimate object of arrest. If the bad guy crashes into anyone, either on purpose or intentionally, the plaintiff is not going to be able to prove that the officer had an intent to cause harm unrelated to the legitimate object of arrest. This dramatically cut the lawsuits on vehicle pursuits. And then a couple of things happened. Um, the only thing left is when the officers did stop movement by a means intentionally applied. So what kind of cases did we have? Well, we had Scott versus Harris, which we'll talk about in a minute, where the officer rammed the car at 90 miles an hour intentionally to stop the pursuit. That's certainly a stopping of movement by a means intentionally applied. We have the Plumhoff case more recently decided, in fact, just in 2014, where officers shot at the car to end the pursuit. And, and that's certainly one. And now recently we have a new case, Mullinex, uh, Mullinex versus Lunar out of the Texas Department of Public Safety, where again, uh, the court uh, looks at a case where an officer shoots at a vehicle from an overpass. So we have these stopping of movements by a means intentionally applied. Some others, roadblocks, stop sticks where we intentionally stop the movement, that would be a Fourth Amendment issue, and certainly the officer's actions would have to be reasonable. In 2007, the U.S. Supreme Court decided a case that actually occurred in 2001, Scott v. Harris out of Coweta County, Georgia. Again, some of you will remember this case because we've discussed it in these series in the past, and, and we've certainly done it in our live training uh, in the classroom. Um, 
Scott vs. Harris was a case where a deputy down in Coweta County spots a vehicle going 73 in a 60 mile an hour zone or something like that. It's a speeding motorist. It's an old beat up Cadillac uh, registered to Victor Harris. Officer doesn't know that Victor Harris is driving, but it turns out that Victor Harris is the driver of the car. Um, when the officer goes to pull it over, Deputy Reynolds, the car takes off at a high rate of speed. And now we have a lengthy uh, pursuit. A couple of things that come up in this case. One, uh, the Supreme Court recognizes that Deputy Scott, who ends up being the defendant in this case, uh, was clearly in violation of Coweta County's pursuit policy. Supreme Court says, look, if you violate a department policy, that doesn't make it a constitutional violation. So it's always important to recognize that, that sometimes we have policies that are more restrictive than the constitutional standard. And I'm gonna to admit to you that in, in the case of pursuits, this is one area where I think law enforcement needs to be more restrictive. And again, it doesn't go to the suspect. This goes to the protection of the police officers. This goes to the protection of innocent third parties who may be hurt uh, if there is ultimately a crash. Bottom line, now we have this chase down in Coweta County. And uh, at one point, Victor Harris pulls into a shopping plaza parking lot. The shopping plaza is closed. It's, I think, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. Um, Victor Harris ends up coming out at uh, another uh, outlet from that uh, shopping plaza. At the same time, Deputy Scott is coming in to the shopping plaza. And there is a slight collision. Um, the cars take off again, and, and Deputy Scott pursues the car. I'll tell you a couple of things. One, uh, Deputy Scott comes over the radio and asks for permission to pit the car. Uh, the pit is a precision immobilization technique. It's very technical, uh, very scientific. Um, and in fact, uh, most of the studies, including one done by the Georgia Chiefs of Police, would indicate that if done properly, it should stop the car without any horrific crash. Um, that said, um, this chase continues. Uh, Deputy Scott got permission from his supervisor to pit the vehicle. Um, the chase continues. Um, there's no question, in fact, the radio transmissions would indicate that there's no question that, uh, in fact, uh, they're going about 90 miles an hour. The chase continues on. Deputy Scott's able to catch up to the car. When he does, he said he's not able to carry out the pit. He didn't have enough room on the roadway, um, they were just unable to carry it out in the technical version. So he decided to ram the car straight on. And when he did, uh, the car leaves the roadway and goes into a ditch. And uh, Victor Harris is a quadriplegic as a result. I'll tell you, the 11th Circuit, which is a very pro-law enforcement circuit, said that when an officer pits a car or rams a car at 90 miles an hour, and I'm sorry, but rams the car at 90 miles an hour, that that creates a substantial likelihood of serious bodily harm or death. And, and the 11th Circuit said, when we're talking about a speeding motorist, and that's what this starts over, then it wouldn't be justified to use deadly force in order to, to stop that motorist. I'll tell you, the case goes up to the United States Supreme Court, and uh, the United States Supreme Court uh, looked at the case, and, and I will tell you that, uh, having been there the day of the oral argument too, as an observer, it was amazing because the justices were really caught up with the video uh, of the event. And this is one of those cases where the video was dramatically helpful to law enforcement, okay? Um, the Supreme Court justices, almost every one of them, mortified by what Victor Harris and, and the potential harm that Victor Harris created to the public. Um, so the Supreme Court, in deciding Scott versus Harris, they decided that a couple of things. One, they said, hey, um, you know, plaintiffs suggest that if the police simply back off, that the bad guy will slow down. And, and the Supreme Court says, well, wait a minute. Um, that's really not a good rule to come up with. They said, we're not gonna create a rule that rewards the bad guy for driving faster because that will require the police to back off. And they go on to say, and what will we set that speed at? 90 miles an hour? So if the bad guy goes 91, he knows he gets away. The Supreme Court also rejected this idea that bad guys will return to normal driving behavior if, in fact, um, the police back off. They said, how does the, 
how do we know that the bad guy doesn't think this is a trick? How do they, uh, maybe uh, officers are up ahead. Uh, maybe they're uh, communicating by radio to ultimately make the stop. Bottom line is that is the court uh, makes a decision and they say um, an officer's attempt to stop a car that poses a threat to the public by high speed flight does not violate the Fourth Amendment. Hey, a period of time goes by, and I'll tell you that from 2007 forward, we don't see any cases um, where the Supreme Court or even the lower courts allow federal lawsuits to go forward in pursuit cases. Um, and then a couple of things happen. One, the Sixth Circuit has a case, Walker versus Davis. And in Walker versus Davis, an officer sees a motorcycle, it's at night, the motorcycle's going a little bit faster than the posted speed limit. The officer tries to stop the motorcycle. And according to the facts that the, uh, the uh, court looks at, and again, Sixth Circuit, it's a case out of Allen County, Kentucky, um, the motorcycle slows down to normal speed. At some point, it's not pulling over, but it's traveling at normal speed, it actually leaves the roadway and goes into a field. Um, there is a collision in the field. I will tell you that the officer says that the collision is an accident. But remember, when the court's considering what we call summary judgment and qualified immunity, the court's looking at the plaintiff set of facts. They're not looking at what we say happened, but because the plaintiff may be deprived of their day in court. So they're only looking at plaintiff's facts. So the court assumes, well, they don't decide, but they assume that there was an intentional collision making this a Fourth Amendment claim in that field. It's the only case that I know of where a court allowed a pursuit case to go forward after Scott v. Harris was decided. Um, the court said this one was nothing like Scott v. Harris. One, you really didn't have high speed because the motorcycle had slowed down to the speed limit. In addition, the motorcycle did not pose a threat to the public by its high speed flight once it was in the field. And so the, the court allows the case to go forward. I'll tell you that the, it never went to trial. Ultimately, the case settled. Moving forward to 2014, we have a case, Plumhoff. And, and Plumhoff, some of you will remember, it's a case out of West Memphis, Arkansas. A officer, a lieutenant, stops a vehicle for a headlight out. Not a big deal. Uh, but when he gets up to the car, he notices a basketball-sized depression in the windshield of the car, which kind of piques his interest. He notices that the driver, Mr. Ricard, and the passenger, Miss Allen, are kind of nervous. Um, at some point, he asks Mr. Ricard to step out of the car, and Mr. Ricard instead pops it into drive. It's a Honda Accord and speeds off, uh, and now we have this high-speed chase up onto the highway. Um, some bad things happen jurisdictionally. Uh, the officers not only leave the state of Arkansas when they cross over the bridge into Memphis, Tennessee, but they actually leave the Eighth Circuit, the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit's jurisdiction, and go into the Sixth Circuit's jurisdiction. Remember, uh, the Sixth Circuit is the same case that decided the Walker case out of Kentucky. Once uh, into Memphis, Tennessee, uh, this, uh, this car leaves the highway, and uh, Mr. Ricard actually at some point spins the car out, loses control, and now he's heading back toward the police cars and three West Memphis cars uh, kind of pin him in, uh, one on each side and one almost head on with him. Uh, in the video of the event, because the whole thing's captured on video, you see Officer Jimmy Evans run up and try to break the passenger door window and, and try to get in the car. You see Officer Lance Plumhoff, who, who's uh, one of the defendants in the case. You see him run up the right front fender of the car. And I'll tell you, in some of the video, it does not appear that the car goes toward Lance Plumhoff, and it really takes a different perspective of the video, which shows the tires on the Honda spinning, to show that Lance Plumhoff is correct, that the car does in fact come at him. Um, bottom line is Officer Plumhoff puts three shots to the windshield. Ricard's able to get the car out of the three-point uh, three pin. He starts to take off again, and we see two officers come up to the passenger door window, fire some shots into the window, and then continue to fire as the car uh, proceeds down the street. Um, bottom line is both the driver and the passenger are killed. I will tell you that Miss Allen's case did not go to the United States Supreme Court. It was only Mr. Ricard's case, the driver. When the Supreme Court looked at that case, 
they looked at a couple of things. One, remember that in Scott v. Harris, they said an officer's attempt to stop a car that poses a threat to the public by high-speed flight doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment. Uh, clearly, Ricard posed a threat to the public by high-speed flight. He had already shown a propensity on this uh, long chase from West Memphis, Arkansas into Memphis, Tennessee. It had reached very high speeds. He had put motoring public uh, on the highway in danger. And so we see this, this uh, certainly a, a, a depravity of heart, if you will, uh, toward the, the motoring public by uh, Mr. Ricard. Supreme Court, when they look at this case, and again, lots of shots fired into the car, they decide nine to zero qualified immunity. In other words, the law wasn't clearly established in 2004 when the officer shot into this car uh, that an officer couldn't shoot under these circumstances. And then the Supreme Court, by a majority opinion, actually grants summary judgment, meaning that this was a constitutional shooting. Hey, I think we need to say a few things about these two cases. One, just because you can under the Fourth Amendment doesn't mean you should. That's one. Two, let's look at the first instance. Uh, Deputy Scott ramming a car at 90 miles an hour. Had the front bumper of his police car hung up on the rear bumper of that car, we'd have been going to a police officer's funeral. There's almost no question in my mind because if those cars had gone together into the ditch, double or the, you know, increase that momentum, have the two steel bodies of the car coming together in that ditch, and it would have been just a horrific, horrific crash. Uh, I don't know if an officer could have survived that. Um, so the officer safety issue. Uh, even Justice Scalia mentions it at the oral argument. He says, look, I think Deputy Scott had to be insane based on what he did. And that what he was trying to get at was the fact that an officer could have been killed in this instance. The other thing is, remember that state law can be more restrictive. So just because you can't under the Fourth Amendment doesn't mean that a local prosecutor might not want to prosecute an officer who does something like what these officers did. I can tell you that initially, Tennessee authorities charged the officers in the Plumhoff case on a, on a criminal basis. Um, so, so again, uh, the state law can be more restrictive. Certainly the state civil law, the tort for wrongful death, for injury to, to the person in the car, can also be more restrictive. So even though you can under the Fourth Amendment, doesn't mean you can under state law. Doesn't mean you should. Um, and so it, it, there's certainly some things that we want to think about in addition to, to just what the Supreme Court has decided. Most recently in the Mullinex case, which is, comes out of Texas DPS, we have a fairly lengthy chase. We have officers trying to put out stop sticks. And we have uh, Trooper Mullinex who is aware uh, of the danger of putting out stop sticks. And he decides to go with his patrol rifle up onto an overpass. And his idea is he's going to shoot the engine block of the car as it goes by to uh, disable the car. One, he asks his supervisor for authority to do that. Uh, he does not hear his supervisor tell him uh, to hold off. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't get that message. Um, he's up on the overpass, and when the car comes by, he aims at the engine block, but ends up striking the driver several times uh, with bullets. And so now we have this lawsuit, uh, Mullinex versus Luna. Interesting, the Fifth Circuit found this to be an unconstitutional shooting. Um, they also denied qualified immunity. The Supreme Court did not decide whether this was a constitutional shooting, but they did say the law was not clearly established at the time that Officer or Trooper Mullinex did this, and therefore um, they granted qualified immunity. Now, one of the questions that raises is, remember the Fifth Circuit said that it was unconstitutional, the Supreme Court did not upset that part of the decision. So at least arguably in the Fifth Circuit, it may be that it's unconstitutional to shoot into the vehicle under these circumstances uh, going forward. So, so that's something that uh, certainly our Texas folks um, have to remember and anybody else uh, that's in the Fifth Circuit, Louisiana, for example. So again, these are, these are some things that we want to watch. Bottom line, Supreme Court does not think a lot of people to take off on the police.
Uh, and in fact, there's a sentencing enhancement case at Sykes, um, and in U.S. versus Sykes, one of the three strikes that Mr. Sykes had was a reckless eluding felony out of Indiana. And he argued to the Supreme Court that this was not a violent crime for purposes of the three strike sentencing enhancement. And the Supreme Court said, we can't think of anything more violent uh, than a subject who takes off on law enforcement and poses a threat to the public. And in fact, there's some great language in the case that says officers may feel duty bound to chase uh, when people take off in this manner. And so again, the Supreme Court found it to be a violent crime for purposes of uh, sentencing enhancement. Again, it was the felony side, and most states now recognize reckless eluding as a, a felony when you take off on the police. I want to turn generally uh, to state law. And remember that every single state has some emergency vehicle operation statute of sorts. Now, we see a variety. Uh, for example, if we go down to Georgia, we see a, a, a standard that says that there's liability if the bad guy crashes into somebody in a pursuit, if the officer acted in reckless disregard of proper police policy in the decision to initiate or continue a pursuit. We see South Carolina, where uh, the, the standard is a straight due regard standard. The officer gets virtually no protection uh, during the pursuit. They have privileges, but if a crash happens, no protection. And then we see the, the most states have a, a, a due care, but then it says an officer will not be relieved of, con of the consequences of their reckless disregard for safety. And most of the states that have that standard recognize that an officer who's negligent um, does not have liability unless they've reached the level of reckless disregard. I must mention though, we have some states, for example, Arkansas has some cases that would suggest that although they have the reckless disregard uh, language in the statute, that an officer is not protected from negligence in a pursuit or emergency vehicle operation. So again, we have to have an understanding of what the state statute is in order to properly evaluate whether a pursuit is going to be justified both from an initiation standpoint and from a continuing standpoint. And the same thing applies in the emergency vehicle operation vein. Again, um, these are all about liability. And we've covered the federal and we've talked briefly about the state. Um, we're going to continue this on and, and for our clients and talk about some state specific stuff uh, in a minute. Uh, but we're going to close out this section first for everybody else. The most important aspect of all of this is the fact that an officer can be catastrophically injured or killed uh, in both emergency vehicle operation and um, pursuits. And when we look at the numbers, they are staggering. More officers are killed uh, in crashes um, and motor vehicle related events than are killed feloniously by things like shooting. So we want to, we really want to get focused on this. <clears throat> and I think one of the things that we have to do before we ever step on the gas in that police car, and it's, this is probably the most important message we can ever give anybody, is if the officer could simply ask himself, if the deputy can simply say to himself, hey, how important is this? How important is this call? How important is this pursuit? And the way to evaluate that is to think about government interest. And, and, you know, I use this example on use of force, and I'm going to use it again here. Let's suppose you were to get a call to the local Walmart for a crime in progress. A shoplifter who just shoplifted a candy bar is running out the front door. Store security is behind them. How fast are you going to go to that call? And I think this is simple to say, how important is this? And to immediately recognize it. I don't think you've got to be police trained or, or sheriff's office trained to realize this. I think what you've got to do, how important is this? And I think most people say, this ain't real important. You know, um, how fast are we going to go to that call? Uh, and how bad would it be if we get injured, if an innocent third party get injured while we're going to the call and that we never get there? So how important is this? Um, and I, I, I think we should mention this. A lot of you are watching this. Uh, and I want my 10-year guys, my 20-year guys, my 25-year guys, 
probably even my three or four year guys to think about this, call up Walmart for a second. And you're gonna to say to yourself, I'm going as slow as I can because I hope the guy's gone before I get there, right? I mean, you're certainly not gonna put yourself at risk for this. But I want you to go back to your first year on the job. Maybe uh, you just got off probation, so we'll put that out of the equation. How fast are you going to this call? And, and I gotta tell you, when I present this in class, I can watch all you guys laugh because I know you're going warp 10 to this call uh, when you're the brand new officer. Um, we understand that and, and we want officers to chase bad guys and, and, and um, to be aggressive in the right sense. But, but the fact of the matter is we've got to control that a bit uh, because it's officers that are getting hurt, it's innocent third parties that are getting hurt. Um, change the equation. Let's suppose that instead uh, we're chasing a serial murderer. Then obviously that changes the equation and that becomes important both from a government interest standpoint but even from a law enforcement standpoint. If we could, if Obviously those two things are, are uh, equal but overall from a government uh, interest standpoint. Um, I want to tell you about a young man and, and um, uh, Max Dorley and, and Max was uh, uh, on my job and uh, you know I was uh, the head of the training academy when Max Dorley became a police officer back many years ago and Max was a phenomenal phenomenal police officer. Uh, Max was uh, heading toward retirement uh, age or tenure and he was uh, had bought a new house down in Georgia. His wife and family had already moved down. Uh, Max is working uh, on a sunny day, day shift, when Anthony Hampton, another great cop, uh, calls for help. Uh, he's at a domestic call, and Max Dorley is driving 43 miles an hour to that call. Hey, um, a line of traffic pulls over for Max, who's operating lights and siren. Um, when he does, the, uh, uh, the line pulls over and that front car turns in front of him. Uh, many of us have seen this happen before. Uh, the, the front car turns in front of him, Max fades right, uh, never has an opportunity to hit the brakes and hits a pole at 43 miles an hour. Um, the tragedy with Max Dorley is this, if Max had his seatbelt on, he'd probably be down in Georgia right now. Uh, but instead, without a seatbelt, he ended up going to that wall in Washington, D.C. Um, and I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir a bit here, but in 20 years, I, I can't recall the number of times I put a seatbelt on. I didn't put a seatbelt on. And I ask this question in class all the time. Um, you know, how many wear their seatbelt uh, in the police car, or how many have driven the car without it? And I'll tell you, the number of hands that go up is staggering. Um, this is one area that we really could control, and it's something that we really need to think about uh, when we start talking about catastrophic injury and death. As, as a final note, I think it's important for all of you to know exactly what your local statute says on emergency vehicle operation and pursuits because there are some differences. While they give you privileges, there's difference in the level of protection they give you, number one. And number two, there's also some distinctions as to what might uh, you have to do in order to get the protection of the statute. So many of the, the statutes say, we got to absolutely make sure you're on a true emergency that's ongoing. So, you know, if you're following in as backup after they've called the cars off, you may not get the protection of the statute. Um, most of the statutes say you have to have light and siren in full operation in order to get the protection of the statute. So it's really important for you to know exactly what your state says uh, as we close out this segment. Okay, we've talked about the law, both federal and just generally at this point, state law as it relates to emergency vehicle operation and pursuits. Let's talk for a few minutes about policy. Um, and I know sometimes policy is like almost a dirty word in our business and uh, officers get upset, particularly uh, in these pursuit policies sometimes when they're more restrictive. Uh, I think you gotta remember, and this is an area where I say to agencies, we do need to be more restrictive uh, than the standard of care that's been set down by the law. And the major reasons for that is because of the injuries that occur, both to innocent third parties, but also to police officers and sheriff's deputies, uh, catastrophic injuries and death. And that in itself is a reason to be more restrictive. Now departments have philosophically taken three positions. And again, there's variations on all these positions, but there's three general positions 
um, types of policies when we're talking about pursuits. The first type is what we call a straight discretionary policy. In other words, the policy does not dictate when an officer can pursue, when they can't pursue by specific facts or specific violations. Instead, the policy directs that the officer has to continually observe the conditions and weigh the need for the chase versus the need for apprehension and try to do a balancing act, taking into account the danger to the public uh, by the pursuit itself. That's a straight discretionary policy. We see variations on that because we see policies that add a restricted piece to that but still have the officer doing that discretionary balancing act as part of the process. Um, the second type is what we call a restrictive policy. And the restrictive policy is the type that says, uh, for example, maybe uh, officers will only pursue for violent felonies. Um, the one that we tend to go with uh, and recommend to our clients is something with the violent felony, but also a second piece. And the second piece would be uh, the, the driver who is reckless prior to contact with police um, or, or the sheriff's deputy. Because we recognize that, hey, the bottom line, if in fact, and I'll just give a personal example. The night that the Red Sox won the World Series, this goes back a few years, they hadn't won it in decades, and they win the World Series, and um, I get off a plane in Warwick, Rhode Island, and I'm coming up Route 90, uh, 295, which is a bypass for Route 95. It's after one o'clock in the morning, I landed at one by the time I got my luggage, and I'm coming up this 295, which is a major highway. Uh, and all of a sudden, here's a truck coming directly at me. Now, I'll tell you, he's on the wrong side of a major highway. He's coming directly at me. There's no other cars on the road. And I'm able to avoid a collision. What's the first thing that I do? Even as a trained police officer, what's the first thing that I do uh, to address that issue? I get on the phone and I call the Rhode Island State Police. And there's no question in my mind, as a citizen, I expected law enforcement to get out to that highway. Not get on going the wrong way, but get out to that highway and take steps to warn other motorists, to maybe shut down a portion of the highway, to take steps to try to stop that individual before harm is caused. So I think we have to recognize that when you have these reckless drivers, that sometimes we do have this obligation and the citizens are going to expect us to get out there and take steps to address them. I'll tell you, there was a Rhode Island case and involved several departments and the Rhode Island State Police. We have got this kind of homeless guy who has stolen, a, I think, a van. Uh, numerous opportunities over several hours to apprehend this guy and get him off the road. And they're all missed uh, for a variety of reasons. One, at one point, he's not actually in a stolen vehicle. He's at a, a parking ride and he's, he's sleeping in the shelter. He's drunk. And law enforcement says, hey, just sleep it off there. Uh, there's several calls into the Rhode Island State Police and a personnel issue, uh, no question. Uh, the trooper at the time had some issues and, and really makes some bad decisions and doesn't immediately send cars out. Bottom line is that this guy ends up recklessly driving, no involvement of the police, uh, although several missed opportunities. Um, he ends up driving and killing a young college student uh, first thing in the morning who's actually driving to class. So it's, it's just a terrible, terrible case. And I'll tell you that all of the agencies involved in that ended up paying out uh, as a result of their failure uh, to address that reckless driver. So, when I talk about a restrictive policy, um, you know, I'm a big proponent that, yeah, you, the, certainly the, the felony, a forcible or violent felony, uh, we're going to go after that guy, and we're still going to do a balancing, um, and we'll talk about the balancing in a minute. We're still going to do a balancing, but we're certainly going to go after that guy. Um, but I also think there's also a need for, for provision in there that talks about the reckless driver. Now, some of you might say, well, Jack, wait a minute. The minute they take off on us, don't they qualify as a reckless driver? And that's why we have suggested. And, and again, this is more restrictive than the standard of care that's set up by the law and by the courts. But we have suggested that, in fact, what needs to be done is we need to say that 
you can't use the driving behavior during the pursuit as the reckless conduct. Because if you do that, we know that all pursuits are reckless on the part of the bad guy. So if we, if we make the rule that any reckless conduct can be involved in the exception, the reckless conduct, swallows the entire rule and the limitations on chases. So again, where we have, generally advocate for a restrictive policy that requires that an officer can pursue in the case of the violent felony or forcible felony, uh, depending on how we define it, and also with reckless conduct pre-pursuit that poses a threat to the public. Then the final kind of policy we see is what we call a straight prohibitive policy, and that's the policy that says no pursuits. And, and I'll tell you, in, in surveying departments around the country, almost no departments have that. And when I say that, there's some, but they're very few and far between. The vast majority, we see some form of restrictive policy. What kinds of things are in all of the policies? And this goes for every state, certainly, that we write for. Um, we do ask officers to, to on, as an ongoing matter, to look at the conditions of the pursuit. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, what time of day is it? Uh, we know that a pursuit that's occurring when there's no traffic on the highway at 3 o'clock in the morning is very different uh, than a, a pursuit that's occurring at 8 o'clock in the morning in a downtown area where everybody's going to work. So two different, really different things. Then we look at things like weather conditions, you know, and I hate to even admit this, but I can remember as a young cop uh, chasing a stolen car in a snowstorm and almost hitting a mass transit bus, you know, didn't hit it, uh, ended up following the footprints in the snow and, and catching the guy, I'll never forget, his name was Joey Smith, but the fact of the matter is, is weather conditions can really impact the safety and the recklessness of a pursuit. Speed. You know, one of the things we see is that, you know, if we have tremendous amount of speed as a result of the pursuit, I'm going to tell you what plaintiff's expert's going to say. Plaintiff's expert's going to say that you're pushing the speed. So in other words, and, and uh, Juan Jeffrey Albert uses this example with juries. He says, look, the, the, uh, the, the bad guy's car is like the capsule that sits up on top of the rocket, right, that leaves Cape Canaveral. And as long as those rocket engines are attached, that You know, the supervisory oversight is very, very difficult, um, but we want to recognize that where supervision is available, that the supervisor is paying attention to all of those environmental factors that we're talking about, so that the supervisor can take action one way or the other in deciding whether that chase could, should continue or whether it should not. Because remember, it's not just the initiation of the chase that's going to be attacked and that's going to be scrutinized if something bad happens. It's going to be the decision to continue the chase, uh, the, the decision to repeat tactics that are being undertaken by the bad guy, you know. Um, 
you know, following them the wrong way on the roadway, which we would never suggest going on the wrong side. Um, if bad guy goes on the wrong side, everything out there would suggest to us that we continue on the right side, certainly try to get ahead of them, certainly use the radio to try to get other uh, police up ahead or sheriff's uh, deputies up ahead or state police up ahead in order to uh, uh, try to warn other motorists and maybe even uh, slow down the roadway or, st or stop the roadway in a way that uh, protects the safety of others. Um, um, certainly uh, take efforts uh, to, to uh, warn using our own equipment in the car, uh, motorists up ahead. But, but again, we'd never suggest that you get on the wrong, highway, wrong side of the highway because that puts two cars uh, in a head-to-head -head situation and a, and a potential uh, crash, head-on crash with other motorists. So again, these are many of the things that we talk about in the policy. Now we're going to turn uh, to your specific state law and talk about the requirements because remember you need to know what the state law is to know what levels of protection you have uh, if you were to get into either an emergency vehicle operation situation where there is a crash or a pursuit situation where there is a crash. Um, so you need to know that so that's where we're going to move next uh, in this session. Under KRS 189.940, uh, officers do get certain privileges with respect to pursuing uh, actual law violators or in the alternative when on a true emergency. Now one of the things that comes up in these emergency vehicle statutes that you have to recognize is that the sheriff's deputy or the police officer has to be, if it's the straight emergency vehicle operation piece, they have to be going to a true emergency. So I think one of the things that we want to be careful of is when the cars get called off, for example, and everybody's been on this call where you're on the way, uh, everybody's got lights and siren going, uh, there's a need to get there, it's an emergency, and the first or second car gets there and says, tell all the cars to slow down. Well, if a plaintiff were able to prove that an officer was operating with lights and siren at a high rate of speed, um, in violation of the normal traffic code, they could argue that the officer was not on a true emergency at that point, and therefore they should have been operating consistently with the traffic code because they've lost their privileges or their exemptions from the traffic code because they're not on the way to a true emergency. So that's, that's something that we, we really need to think about. Once the cars are slowed, once the, you know, the call on the radio comes out, hey, tell the cars to disregard, then we cannot keep operating in that emergency mode. Um, with respect to uh, the, the pursuit of actual or suspected uh, law violators, I think that's a no-brainer because the person takes off from law enforcement and obviously they're a law violator. So I, I don't see any significant issue there. Remember that the statute grants exemptions. Um, and again, knowing that it's going to be a true emergency or it's going to be an actual pursuit, you get exemptions and they're exemptions related to speed, exemptions relating to the direction of travel, exemptions related to parking, and exemptions related to passing uh, traffic signals, meaning you know both uh, traffic control devices, meaning both stop signs, yield signs, uh, red lights. One of the things to recognize is that the statute gives you authority uh, to pass those after slowing and making sure you can go through that intersection safely. Uh, one of the things that we highly recommend is that you come to a complete stop. We recognize that most of the accidents are intersection action accidents and they can be horrific at these intersections. Uh, just mention uh, a couple of things here on the intersection accidents. and I actually had a case uh, where this happened where officers get sued, they're not actually uh, participants in the suit, uh, but there's actually a county sheriff's deputy chasing this car it, for very good reason, it's a, it's a good pursuit, uh, but officers up ahead of the pursuit decide to try to put out stop sticks. They put them out some distance before a major intersection in an attempt to stop the car before it reaches that intersection, but the car is able to go around the stop sticks and actually the major collision occurs at this intersection. One of plaintiff's arguments in that case 
is that law enforcement should have gone and protected those, the cross traffic at the intersection. They should have blocked off the intersection. That's one of the arguments that was made. I've seen that come up in several cases, and I think it's something that you ought to be aware of. If we were to have the resources uh, to protect the intersection, then that's maybe something that a supervisor might consider directing. Maybe the officers working may consider directing uh, when we're not involved in the actual pursuit. Uh, I'm not in any way critical, believe me, of these officers trying to stop sticks because, you know, one of the, one of the arguments, the, the, the alternative argument is if the guy makes it through this intersection that we blocked off, then what about the next intersection? And, and you know, we get out into rural Kentucky and we're not going to have enough resources to block every major intersection. Going back to the statute, so got to be actual or suspected law violator, uh, got to be a true emergency. Also, in order to get the benefit of the exemptions, you've got to have both light and siren in operation. So remember, if you were to be exceeding the speed limit and not have light and siren in operation and something bad happens and you're traveling at high speed, you're in violation of the statute, you will not be protected because the exemptions require that you have light and siren in operation at the time. Um, unlike other states, there is no provision in the statute itself for, a, say, say, a silent run uh, where we're trying to sneak up on somebody. Uh, there's no provision for that. So no light and siren, you are got to revert back to normal driving behavior. Um, hey, the statute... Unfortunately, you know, most states have something we call a reckless disregard statute. And the reckless disregard statutes are generally really good because if an officer is acting consistently with all the provisions of the statute, so they got the light and siren going, um, they're driving along, something bad happens, most states have what we call a reckless disregard statute that says, the officer has liability only if they've acted in reckless disregard of the consequences of their act. Now, reckless disregard is something really different than just straight due regard. Uh, due regard treats you more like every other motorist. Um, Kentucky has a due regard statute. Now, it's due regard in light of all these other factors in the statute. So in other words, if, if a bad crash were to happen, the judge would have to instruct the jury, for example, that, hey, the officer has an exemption under the statute that allows them to exceed the speed limit. So the, they get instructed on that, but they would also get instructed that the officer, whether it be the deputy or the patrol officer, uh, depending if we're talking about a county or a municipality, um, has an obligation to act with due regard for the motoring public. So again, it's, it's not the best protective type of statute that we see. Bottom line, under the statute, is we see several things. We see first, uh, we want to see that it's an actual or suspected law violated. To me, that one's a no-brainer. Uh, or in the alternative, it's straight emergency vehicle operation, that there is a true emergency and it's ongoing. It hasn't ceased to, to be an emergency. Uh, light and siren. Uh, but always remember that you still have the obligation for the straight due regard standard. Thank you again for uh, joining us and uh, look forward to the continued Lauren Best Practices series uh, and providing you with as much information as we possibly can.